So we're going to look at confidence intervals this week. And there's a lab available here. I'm going to make a copy of this lab and rename it. So then I can write some things for my answers, make note of things as I go. Uh, the goal here is to make a 90% confidence interval for the mean price of a home uh, in the area in which your school is located. So I'm in Pendleton right now, so I'm going to choose Pendleton. Some of you may be in Hermiston or some other town. So you have a few options as far as collective data goes. You can do your own research, checking out your newspaper or other online services that list real estate prices for homes in your area, collect at least 35 of them, or you could use one of my data sets on Pendleton for May or Hermiston, Oregon for May. And I'm going to choose to do the Pendleton data. So the Pendleton data comes as a view only uh, Google Sheet. So again, I'm going to make a copy of it and rename it. And I've already started working on it a little bit. So I want to do some summary statistics. And standard summary statistics are to count the data. So I use the count command on that column. Find the mean, which is the average. Standard deviation, and we want the standard deviation of a sample, so STDEV or STDEV.S, definitely not a population. Uh, coefficient of variation is good to uh, take a look at, so notice the average spread of these home prices is about 42% of the center. And uh, in May, the average price was 260, almost 264000 uh, these numbers, by the way, are in thousands, and I just typed them in thousands because it was easier. I didn't have to type a whole bunch of zeros uh, for certain prices. So if you see a price like 165, it means 165,000, and the mean here isn't 263 dollars and 84 cents; it's 263 thousand dollars. So the average home price was a little higher than I thought it would be. Uh, I did see uh, a website when I searched for uh, prices. Uh, I think it was realestate.com or realtor.com that said the median price was 225000 in Pendleton. And so you might ask yourselves, why would the median price be less than the mean? I uh, also want the five-number summary. So min, quartile 1, the 25th percentile, the median or 50th percentile, quartile 3, 75th percentile, or the max. I also found the IQR and the range of prices that I have to deal with. So the prices ranged from a low of 42000 for a home, a max at the time I looked of 625000 And so that gives me a spread of uh, like $450,000 between the lowest cost home and the highest cost home. The middle 50% of homes were about $170,000 apart. So that went from about $180,000 up to $350,000. So 75% of the houses I looked at were $350,000 or less. 50% um, of the houses I looked at were about $240,000 or less. Right, so that's what that tells me right there. Uh, I took the data and copied and pasted it into StatKey. So let's review that right here. So I want to highlight that whole column and copy it, control C on a Windows computer or command C on a Mac. And then I'm going to go over to stat key. And uh, one quantitative variable is where I can get summary statistics and do a box plot, histogram, dot plot by just editing the existing data, deleting what's there, and pasting in the data we want. And I did copy the header row, but I don't have a first column of identifiers. So I want to be careful of which I select here, otherwise I'll just screw stuff up. So there's the dot plot of the data. I want a histogram. And the first histogram they give me here has 10 buckets ranging from the min of 42,000 to the max of 625,000. So I'm just going to uh, edit that a little bit. I'm going to have it start at zero and go up to 650 and let's see if I wanted buckets to be 50,000 wide then I would want 12, 13 buckets a little arithmetic in my head and then what happens is these are nice so that's 
150, 100, 150, 200, 250, 300. And when I point to one of these uh, over on the right hand side, it tells me what the lower up and upper bound of each box is in my, or each column is in my histogram. And I pick those boundaries just because 100,000 and 200,000 and 300,000 are nice numbers. And because when I looked at the box plot, it showed me 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, so I can put these together. So I need to do a screenshot of these. If you use Google Drive, you have to save the screenshot. And then you can insert that screenshot into your um, spreadsheet or Word document. And I chose to insert them here. Uh, so for example, to get that image in there, I had to pick a spot for it to be, insert, image, over cells, don't put it in a cell, it doesn't work so well, and then find the image that you want. So I'm on my Mac here, and my Mac automatically calls my screenshots, screenshot date and time. So then I could grab the screenshot I want, open it up, and then Google just slaps it in. Once I get a screenshot of the histogram and the box plot, then I have to move them around and resize them a little bit so the scales line up. And so the goal here, come on, there we go. The goal here was to make sure that the 100 on the box plot lines up with the 100 on the histogram. 400 on the box plot lines up with 400 on the histogram. And so I just have to use a little bit of resize and moving around to make that happen. So this gives me some information about the spread. So I can see that the narrowest quarter of data, the second quarter here between the first quartile and the median, is where the taller stacks live. And then any place that has a really long whisker like over here is where I would expect to see the shorter stacks. Okay, so remember, 25% of the data lives out in this whisker here. 25% of the data lives between that median uh, bar and the 75th percentile right here. So 25% of the data lives somewhere from about 200, almost that 220,000 up to almost 350,000 in there. And 25% of the data lives in this region right here in that whisker. All right, so let's take a look at what we need to do. So is the Pendleton data. I computed my summary statistics. Check. I made a box plot and histogram. Check. Uh, define the random variable. Okay, let's define the random variable. Shift enter to get a new line, right? If you just hit enter, that gives you a new number. That's not what we want. There we go. So the random variable is the average home price in the area you're looking. So in Pendleton. And it's a variable because it changes from time to time and there's a lot of randomness that affects that value. Um, supply and demand, people's wants and needs, number of houses in the region, and so on. Uh, so the random variable is the average home price in, in this case, Pendleton. So let's make it a different color, make it stand out a wee bit. All right, and then here, those are in the spreadsheet. We should put that in the spreadsheet too. All right, so next I want to calculate a 90% confidence interval. So what is a confidence interval? So um, I mentioned earlier that uh, uh, I, I saw online when I was searching for now Pendleton, Pendleton homes for sale. I get an ad for Zillow right here, and then I get Realtor.com, which says, "Hey, there's 116 homes for sale in Pendleton right now with a median listing price of $225,000." So how do they know it's $225,000? So they say measure that, and that's just the current houses they're looking at. So some realtor might actually, you know, make a claim if somebody wants to move to Pendleton. Oh, by the way, you know, the median price of a home in Pendleton is 225000 this year. Well, that's at that moment in time, and, and they're going to make that statement for 
uh, the whole year, most likely, and that's what somebody will believe. Uh, it's not actually, because we don't have every single house that was for sale. They could be missing some here. There's some that have come and gone throughout the year, and there's some new ones that will appear later in the year. So this is a what we call a point estimate for the population uh, parameter. Population parameter, again, is just a value related to the population. In this case, the median or mean house price. I could use the data that I collected here and claim that the, let's highlight that, the average house price in Pendleton uh, this year is about $264,000. Uh, that would be, again, a point estimate. For the population parameter. What is the population parameter I'm talking about here? Uh, the population parameter we're talking about here is the average home price. Average home price in Pendleton 2019. Okay. Missed my letter there. So that is my parameter. And this $263,000 or $264,000 roughly is my point estimate for that parameter. Now the problem with that point estimate is it's based on this particular sample. If somebody else did a sample, they might get a slightly different number than that. So whose is right? And the answer is neither is right, but they're, they're just estimates for the population, not the exact population. We'll, we'll never know that. Well, if it's not the exact one, then we should be able to measure what we call a margin of error. And so I'm going to show you how to do that now. There's several ways to do it. We're going to start off with a super easy one right now. The super easy one is just to take the data and copy it into Stat Key. And I'm going to bring up a new tab in Stat Key here. And instead of just getting descriptive statistics on my, my data set, I am going to go for a bootstrap confidence interval. And I'm going to do it for single mean. We can do a proportion later. So for a mean, I need to be in the right section, confidence interval for a mean. I need to be doing a, a bootstrap dot plot of the mean. And then I want to edit my data. And here they were doing Mustang prices. I want to replace their data with my data. And again, I do have home prices as the header, so I'm going to leave that button checked. OK. All right, so here is the a dot plot for the data that I have right there. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to resample with this data. And so what does resampling mean? Uh, so imagine that I have a deck of 50 cards. And why do I say 50? Because I had 50 houses in my sample. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to shuffle that deck, and I'm going to I'm going to withdraw a card and look at it, write it down, put the card back in the deck, shuffle it, withdraw another card, look at it, write down what I got, put the card back in the deck. And I'm going to keep doing that, shuffling the cards, and I'm, until I've, I've written down 50 numbers. Okay? So I can generate one sample. And so what happens here is this original deck of cards was reshuffled, and the cards were pulled out one at a time with replacement. And so this is a new random sample of home prices based on the old one. Now notice the, the dot plot looks a bit different there. Okay? Again, that's because it's a, it's a new shuffling of that deck uh, with replacement. So some of the homes get selected more than once. So for example, there was only one home originally at 625000 when I redrew from that sample, uh, that $625,000 house came up more than once. Uh, over here, there was a house that was uh, 469 dollars and that 469 dollars came up more than once. And there's going to be some house price, housing prices that were listed in here that aren't going to be listed here because they didn't ever get drawn, and that's okay. All right, so I have, and then what happens is uh, Stack Key then calculates the mean of that new sample and plots it here. So I could do that again, generate one sample. And so uh, we shuffled that deck. I got this new set of 50 housing prices, and they have a mean over here. And I could do 10 of those. So this one right here, 
You can see off to the side, this is the dot plot to go with that one. This one over here has that dot plot. Uh, so again, what I'm doing is I'm resampling from the original one. This is called a bootstrap uh, distribution. And what I'm plotting over here are the means of each of those samples of 50. So right now I have 12 samples of 50 each, and I'm only looking at the mean here. If I point or click on any one of those means, I can see what that sample looked like, and it's a little different than the original. So I could do 100 of them. And every time I point to one of these dots, I can see the sample it came from. And each of these dots is an average. I could do a thousand of them. And another thousand. And so what you want to do is, based on a data set, if you want to find a confidence interval, you just want to generate at least 6,000 or 5,000, 8,000, anywhere in there, uh, high thousands, um, resamples from of that same size that you started with. Okay, so right now I have 3,112 samples of 50, and I'm plotting each of their means here. This is called a sampling distribution. It's a distribution of sample means. And keep going. Uh, this is hurting my computer here. It's a little slow eventually. Okay, I think we're catching up there. So notice this, it's starting to... to fill up here and even out, and most of the time when you do a sampling distribution of means, it's going to have this kind of shape to it. To make a 90% confidence interval out of this reshuffling of the data, I want to select the two-tail button, and then I want to select boundaries on how much of the data I want to look at. So right now the computer is saying, okay, let's, let's look at the middle 95% of samples here. And if we do that, the computer says the middle 95% of samples gives average prices that are between 234.6 thousand and 295.1 thousand. And so what we've created right here is a confidence interval at a 95% confidence interval. For this lab, I asked you to create a 90% confidence interval, so I enter 0.9 for my proportion. And so then it looks at all my 6,000 samples here, and it collects the middle 90% of them. And it says on the left side, the lowest one they grabbed, so that's the, the black ones, the red ones are the ones we're ignoring for a moment. Uh, low price was 238.6 thousand roughly, and 289.062. Uh, how to round these numbers. So if we look back at the data, usually we round one more place than the data. So it looks like I went to the nearest tenth of a thousand, the nearest hundredth. So then in my confidence interval, I would report back uh, to the nearest uh, hundredth here, since my data was to the nearest tenth. So I have a couple of things here. I have a point estimate, and the point estimate is the 263.5 Originally, the sample was 263.8. What you'll find is when you do a confidence interval, the mean of this distribution here will be pretty darn close to the mean of the original sample. Okay? We also believe that the mean of the distribution and the mean of the sample are close to the actual population mean, this mysterious number we're trying to calculate. So a couple things I could state here. I could say, well, it looks like my uh, average house price in Pendleton is around 263.5 thousand. That's that middle number there. And then the margin of error would be the distance from the center to the edge. So I'm going to take a screenshot of this, stick it in Google Sheets, and write some of this stuff down. So, screenshots. The screenshot, all I need is this window right here and the numbers at the bottom. I don't need the side dot plots. And let's stick that in where? Let's put it in a spreadsheet. I don't put stuff in a spreadsheet. So, new tab. And paste that. Oops. Paste it in. With Google Sheets, you have to. Load it. All right, so insert image over cells and then find the screenshot that you took. So in Windows, you'll be using the snipping tool for this. And 
I want a screenshot on the 28th. And what time is it now? Is it really already 10 p.m.? Oh my goodness. Go to bed soon. Alright, grab my image and slap it in there. Okay, so there that is. So I'm just going to make some information, write some information down based on this. Oops, I'm going to do this. Settle down. Alright, so this left number here, that would be the lower bound of my confidence interval. And remember, what is an interval? So an interval is just a range of values. And so I have an upper number there too. So my lower number is going to be 238,500, I might as well do the whole thing, 77,000. Okay, so that's the number in thousands, and this one in thousands would be 289,062. All right. Uh, the point estimate for uh, this particular problem would be the average. And the average here is 263.541. Actually, I'm doing it in thousands, so points. Okay. And the next thing I want to know is what's the margin of error? So the margin of error is the distance from the center to the left. Uh, now, ideally, this is a perfectly symmetric in interval, but in reality, they're not symmetric. So what we'll find is the distance from the center to the left is going to be a little different than the distance from the center to the right. Um, and so what I usually do is I calculate the distance all the way across and then cut it in half. So for my margin, margin, I'm going to go equals parentheses, take this right number, subtract the left number, that gives me the distance across the interval, and then I want to cut it in half. And so my margin of error is listed right there, so it's what um, commas would be nice for that. Let's see, somewhere here there's a comma format, number is a comma format. Okay, so it's about 25,000 uh, for my margin of error. Okay. So, where are we at in the description? Let's see, we'll come back to that picture in a minute. So, confidence interval and the error bound. Okay, so for the confidence interval, shift enter for me to get a new line. The confidence interval, usually we state intervals with parentheses, and you just state the lower number and the upper number. Um, and so, let's see if we go. With the original way the data was put in thousands, then we get 238.577. 238.577 is the lower value, and the upper value of our confidence interval is 289,062. Let's get this up a touch. Uh, definitely pushing the limits of my computer today. It's a little slow here. Okay, so that's the confidence interval numerically. I'll state an interpretation for that in just a minute. And the error bound. So the error bound is sometimes called the margin of error. Sometimes it's just called the error. Sometimes you'll see it called the error bound on the mean. So error bound, aka margin of error, aka just error, in this case aka would also be called an error bound on the mean, which is a random variable as a mean here. And let's see, back here I calculated that the margin of error was, if I go to the nearest thousand, it would be 25,000.242, let's say. The original, and the original. All right. So error bound on the mean, 
equals about 25,000.242. All right. And sometimes I'll include, like, if it's dollars, I'll include the dollars. I'm not going to right now. All right. So let's see. I'm going to ask for an interpretation here somewhere. There's my pretty picture. Okay, in two or three complete sentences, explain what a confidence interval means in general, and one or two complete sentences, explain what this confidence interval means. Okay, so I'm going to do question number two here, new line. So what does it mean? So we believe with 90% confidence, is what we started with. How do I know it was 90% confidence? Two reasons. One, I asked for a 90% confidence interval, and two, in stat key, I set that middle percentage to collect 90% 90 90 of the samples in the middle there. I set the 90% confidence interval. Uh, what would happen if I went for like a 99% confidence interval? We can't have a 100% confidence interval, by the way. It's not possible. Uh, we believe with 95% confidence that the average home price in Pendleton 2019 is between, right, it's an interval, so interval is between, uh, let's see what those numbers again, 238.577, let's just copy them, paste them in, so I'm going to type them. is between two hundred and thirty-eight thousand five hundred and seventy-seven dollars and two hundred and eighty-nine thousand sixty-two. Bang. So that would be one way to interpret the comments interval. So let's highlight that in blue maybe today. All right, uh, another way to interpret it, oops, shift enter, sorry about that, uh, would be to talk about the center and the margin of error. So uh, with 90% confidence, slightly different wording, we believe that the average, so I know it's spelling issues, Got it, thank you, Google. Um, price in 2019, Pendleton. Is, what was that, 263,000? What was the rest of that? 263,541 is what that said. 41. Now, here I'm slightly uh, misleading because I can never nail the exact population value. There's always going to be an error involved. So the margin of error has hidden within it that error. Uh, so if, if whenever people give uh, their belief, their point estimate without a margin of error, then they're not giving you the truth because uh, that's super important. So I should make a note that this has a margin of error of 25,000. Where's the rest of that? 243, if I round to the nearest whole number. Okay, so that's another way to word it. Let's make that one. Red, purple maybe, all right. Okay, one more way just for fun, and let's make this one red. So let's do the width, 90% confidence. We believe the average Home price in Pendleton, I'm going to 
simplify this just a little bit, is within 25,000 of 264,000, rounding just a touch. Right, so within is my margin of error, and the center is that 264,000. We believe that the average home price in Pendleton is within 25,000 of 264,000. So there's a lot of ways to word it, right? English is a very versatile language, as are most languages. And somehow you need to get a point across that there's a range of numbers that could be the actual one. We think it's the actual number somewhere in that range. Okay, uh, so I'm going to make a little sketch to go with that. And change back to black. Insert, let's see if I can make a sketch here. Drawing new. All right, so I'm going to have to zoom out a little for this. And again, I, I would recommend not doing this on a computer, drawing it on paper. It's way easier than take a picture and send me the picture or upload the picture into your document. All right, ready, Google? There we go. All right, so let's see. Can I use the scribble tool to do this? So whenever we do confidence intervals, and we're going to do this, uh, something like this, every day for the rest of the quarter, what we want to do is we want to draw a smooth version of this shape right here. This is called a bell-shaped curve. And I have another sketch of it hidden in the lab, which we can't see at the moment. Let's see. I guess I'm just going to draw my own. So let's move up here. Okay, so I'm going to draw a straight line down there. It's my best straight line. And then my best bell-shaped curve, like that. And then what we want to do is we want to draw a line down the center there. And that's where we're going to mark our uh, point estimate. Oops. That didn't come out so good. Let's try that again. Um, I was trying to make a dollar sign. There we go. I have to draw slow to 64. Eh, not bad. Was my center. And then let's switch colors here to maybe blue. And then I want to make a mark on each side to contain my confidence interval. So I'm containing 90. Whoa. 90, oh, that's getting worse. Looks like I need a new drawing tool. I don't usually use Google Draw. 90, come on, Google Draw. Not bad. Percents. Goes in the middle. And then each tail would then contain 5%, because it has to add up to 100% altogether. So there'd also be 5% in this tail over here. <laughs> this is challenging. <laughs> and it's easier to draw by hand. It's just the five right there. Uh, and then my, my numbers on each side, I want to draw those in too. So let's see, those were roughly, let's go with uh, 239 and 289. Where was I right here? So this number is 2. 30. Whoa, that did not come out good. Sorry about this. 30. <laughs> this is funny. Oh man, look at that shit. Excuse me. These lines have to be drawn in two parts. Oh, come on, people, stop messing with me. Then this one would be 2. 89. Let's see, can I? Eight. Not bad. All right, let's throw in the dollar sign. And the dollar sign. And then I also want to show the margin of error here, too. 
So we want all of this information in here. And so the margin is either the center to the right or the center to the left. I'm just going to go center to the right. And that number was what? About 25,000. So this is my best picture with my drawing tool of that information. So I have a 90% confidence interval. My point estimate is 264,000. My margin of error is 25,000. And that leads to each of these uh, endpoints. So either I can say the home average home price is between 239,000 and 289,000, or I could say it's within 25,000 of 264,000. And, and sometimes we'll write that a little bit different. So um, let's save this into my sheet. So another shortcut for saying um, the center and the margin of error, I could write something like uh, 264,000 uh, plus or minus the 25,000. So that's the center plus or minus the margin of error. So mean plus or minus the error bound on the mean. So we have two different ways to state the margin of error. We can state lower bound and upper bound, or we could say state the center and the spread. And, and that is a spread. It is related to the standard deviation, and we'll get to that relationship in a couple of weeks. It's kind of complicated. For now, the easy way to do confidence interval is to get your data, go to stack key confidence interval, edit, paste your data in, generate, generate, generate thousands of samples, say give me a two-tailed 90% or 95%, whatever, um, and then bang, stack key just gives you the interval in the center. You have to calculate the margin of error by finding the total distance across and cutting it in half. So you can read all about this in chapter... This is chapter 8 in the book, I believe. Please read about it. And uh, there's a whole bunch of other videos that I have listed in the course. I've gotten through about half of the lab here, so get started on it. Uh, I'll have another video where I finish up some of these extra questions down here. Uh, so we're going to take a look at what happens if we try to do a 50% confidence interval or a 99% confidence interval. So just a real quick version of that here. Instead of 90, I could jump to a 99% confidence interval. So uh, 0.99 is 99%. And the pro and the con is now I'm more confident, right? I'm 99% confident that I've captured the real number. However, my interval is quite wider. Notice my margin of error jumped from 25,000 to now it's about 40,000 is my margin of error. So if you want to be more confident, you have to have a wider interval, right? So maybe you're working for some company and they say, man, that, that margin of error is way too big. I, I don't like it. And then you say, okay, I'll lower the margin of error. And you'll say, yeah, I'll just be 50% confident. And so now I can get the margin of error much smaller and maybe make my boss happy. But he says, what do you mean 50% com confident? You can't be, you got to be more confident than 50%, right? So there's this balance, like, uh, if you're if you lower your confidence level, you can have a narrower margin, but people aren't going to be very happy with only 50% confidence, right? They want a higher confidence level, and so then the question we have to answer later is how can we be more confident and lower the margin of error? Okay, and so that's a more complicated question we'll answer later. For now, we just have to get used to the idea of a confidence interval in all of its pieces. Its pieces are if you look back at my picture. So there's my hand-drawn picture. Let's look at the computer-drawn picture I have here. You have your confidence level. Okay, so that's like 90% or 95%. And then you're going to have your point estimate, the center value. The interval are the edge numbers related to your data. So in this case, there are dollar values for home. So low estimate and a high estimate. Now, I'm not saying this is the value of a house. This is the average value of all houses in this region, is what I'm trying to pinpoint. Uh, and then based on uh, that span across there, half of that span is always going to be the margin of error. Okay? So given the center and the margin of error, I can add and subtract to get the upper and lower values. 
or given the, the upper and lower values, I can always find the center and the margin of error. All right, that's it for now. Do good math. Stay in touch.